So welcome, welcome again to Building the Commons, Community Archiving and Decentralized Storage. Uh, this event today will shine a spotlight on the intersection of decentralized storage solutions and community archive projects. The event uh, was designed for uh, enthusiasts, community archivists, researchers, librarians, civil society folks, researchers. Whoever you are out there, if you have an interest in this topic, we welcome you. The event is supported by an award from the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. My name is Billy Pickett. I'm with TechSoup. I'm the head of Maker Labs at TechSoup, and I'll be your host today. TechSoup is a global network that's all about bridging technology solutions and services for public good or public benefit. Our mission is to build a dynamic bridge that leverages technology to enable connections and innovative solutions for a more equitable planet. So with that, I want to introduce our uh, guest expert who's going to share some opening remarks, Daniel O'Brien of the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Hey, everyone. I'm going to be super quick. I'm a senior fellow at the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. My background was from the nonprofit world. I used to work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and also spent some time at the Committee to Protect Journalists. I also set up uh, a nonprofit, a digital rights nonprofit in, in the UK. So I known TechSoup for a long time. I know this community. I, I pretend to know some of the challenges that we all face with a sort of social goal and bringing it to fruition, particularly with the help and hindrance sometime of technology. I just want to very quickly frame some of the amazing people you're about to see in the terms that, that we think of these things. We're going to talk about technology. We're going to talk about archiving, and we're going to talk a little bit implicitly about decentralization. I'm not an expert in archiving, so I'll leave that to the real experts, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the decentralized storage part of it. Uh, I think most of the folks here would identify with uh, a social and technical kind of initiative or movement, which is uh, the decentralized web. It's a, 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 a general uh, move to re-decentralize the internet, the, the, the net when it was first built and when many of us perhaps got first excited about it, it was really designed to avoid some of the pitfalls that people imagine might happen as the world digitized. Seventies fears of, of a dystopian world of centralized control and, and, and no privacy. We tried. Uh, in many ways, these problems creeped in in other ways. The concentration of power into a few large tech companies, the pervasive use of personal data as, as an asset to be exploited rather than uh, an important part of the social fabric. So I encourage you all to look into that wider movement here. Let me let me throw you uh, a link in, and that's something to read later on. But we are, as I say, going to concentrate on something a little bit more practical, a little bit affects a lot of organizations and a lot of communities, which is storage and archiving. In the real world, in the non-digital world, I should call it, when you see something precious, you put it in a safe, you bury it, it, you keep it where no one can see it. But that's not how knowledge works. Precious information, you don't want to keep it in one place because if that one place gets corrupted or, or the place you're storing it with goes bankrupt or suddenly decides that it doesn't want your business anymore, or it just has a single cosmic ray cut through its RAM or hard drive at just the wrong time, then you lose that data. Lots of copies keep stuff safe in the digital world. And you want it to be resilient and distributed across different networks, across different places geographically. I'm going to just throw in one statistic before I, I go, which is I was reading this article again. I'm more of a, a links person than a slide person. So I'll paste this in and I hope we'll add that to the documents you, you get said. But this is an article which really shocked me. It says, when the researcher broke down the results by publisher, this is academic publishers, less than 1% of the 204 publishers have put the majority of their contents into multiple archives. Fewer than 10% have put more than half the content at least to archives. And a full third seem to be doing no archiving at all. And that's for big academic concerns for individuals and the communities, it gets even more trepidous. And 
I'm hoping that the technologies that a lot of people are building around this, including the people you're going to hear from, uh, uh, have a, are an opportunity to provide those who are least well treated by the centralized systems. I think that includes so many nonprofits because we all have to hitch a ride on commercial offerings rather than have ones that are cut out exactly for us. But I, the things that I want, perhaps you, if you're listening to everything, you're blown away by everything. Things to think about as you listen to amazing speakers is think about autonomy. Like how can your organization have some independence, not just from those centralized companies, but multiple technologies. How can you keep lots of copies and not have dependencies? Authenticity. I think there's going to be a good discussion about how can you show to others and to yourself that your data is uh, safe, hasn't been tampered with, and is reliable. And finally, accessibility, always the most important part of it. Is this software easy to use? Is this something I can imagine doing? And is this something that is going to be available and usable by the communities who benefit from those archives, both now and in the many years to come? Okay, that's all I've got to say. Have a, a great tour around some of the, the amazing work that our partners are doing in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Okay, and with that, our first demo is Kalani Nicole from Transfer. Kalani has been exploring decentralized networks and virtual worlds in contemporary art since 2013. Her focus is supporting artists with critical technology, practice, and prototyping alternative cultural infrastructure. Currently, she's building the Transfer Data Trust, a decentralized archive and cooperative trust for cultural value exchange. Kalani resides in Miami and New York City as a visiting scholar at NYU Tandon School of Engineering and the Integrated Design and Media Program. With that, Kalani, you have the mic. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And thanks, Danny, for that great warm up. Uh, touched on a lot of ideas that will also be echoed in my talk. Uh, it's always great to be in a community with you all. So, the title of my talk, if we go to the next slide, is talking about decentralizing contemporary art. Um, the URL you can get more information about my practice is transfer.art. Um, so on the next slide, I'm gonna share some background and a quick demo of an idea that I've been working on for over a decade, which is how can we decentralize conservation and care of experimental media art? Um, it will be very focused on the art world, but I hope many of you will find things that resonate also for your specific fields or industries. Um, so for some quick background on the next slide, although digital art has just recently become recognized in popular culture, the history of time-based media art started way back in the 1930s with the Bauhaus and really became an artistic avant-garde movement in the 1970s with the experiments in art and technology from engineer Billy Kluver and artist Robert Rauschenberg. And that was in a moment of incredible artistic invention. Engineers were partnering with artists to prototype incredible new things, everything ranging from fog machines to CCTV and even immersive installations, which have become really a part of popular culture now. And so throughout history, we have seen time and time again that artists are the source of R&D for great shifts in culture, although they're often not recognized or compensated for these massive changes that their work puts into motion. So this animated GIF called Underwater Internet is from Faith Holland, and it's a reminder that our data has an endpoint. And the sea changes coming to our world with these technologies of power will create disruptive evolutions in our lifetime. At Transfer, I've been working with artists who think critically about technology in their practice. And great art, I believe, helps us better understand our contemporary moment. And there is a generation of artists working in these historical avant-garde traditions started way back in the 1970s who have been showing us distant early warnings about what's to come. And this historic artistic movement is in a very precarious position because it has been treated as an outsider art for more than 50 years. One more bit of background before I get into my demo. This is a prototype I built in Material Framework back in 2017, and I tested it with 10 artist studios for feedback. I work in tech as a UX researcher, so this is part of my practice. And the ideas in this prototype were really about distributed care and transparency. 
So the art world is a very centralized and opaque system. If you're an artist, a gallery will take your inventory, they centralize it, they hand you a contract with terms that say they get 50% of everything you sell, and they control your information, relationships, and opportunities. So at Transfer, we have been asking, what if it were the other way around? What if as an artist, you retain control over your inventory and allowed access to the people who are supporting you? What if you had full transparency about the relationships around your practice? What if there were ways you could build equity in your work in your lifetime, even if the market is slow to see your vision? So this reversal of power dynamics in the art world is a fundamental design principle that we're building a new kind of open cultural infrastructure around a transfer. This brings me to the Transfer Data Trust, and there are a few key observations that came from many years of iterations on these concepts. The first is that the art market is quite unique. It has a well-tested method for assigning monetary value to data, and that's through the appraisal of time-based media artwork, which is essentially data. So as a collector, an institution, or a gallery, you can hire a third party to appraise the value of your artworks. This puts experimental media artists with data-based studio practice in a very unique position to leverage this market and experiment with the emergence of data DAOs and other similar concepts in the decentralized storage ecosystem, which are also seeking to build equity around data. So it's a very similar problem space. The second observation is that currently experimental media artists do not have the means to appraise and handle the constant updates and conservation that is required for complex software-based artworks. This specialized knowledge is quite expensive, it's time-consuming, it's centralized in institutions and private collections, and even institutions and great museums have trouble keeping up with this overhead due to outdated practices that are really based around physical artworks. So what this all means is that generations of avant-garde artists who have quite literally built the cultural conditions for AI, NFTs, and even crypto at large have uh, massive amounts of data sitting around in hard drives. And this has no value until someone with money or centralized power comes along to validate that worth. NFTs came along and built speculative value around a lot of really bad art. Uh, but this is not the same as cultural value on which the art market operates, which takes time to accrue. I don't know about you, but for me, crypto punks and bored apes don't really reveal much about the human condition. So my hypothesis is that there is so much historic inventory right now sitting dormant in latent space. And I believe all artists have all the power in this moment to take their equity into their own hands and unlock new value around their practice within these emergent e decentralized technology ecosystems. So on the next slide, this is the vision of the Transfer Data Trust. It's a peer-to-peer artist-owned archive and cultural value exchange, and it's offered to everyone in the ecosystem. I really hope that as we build this out, others can fork this model and really own their data in a different way. So on the next slide, there are three key components, a decentralized storage network, which I'm going to show you a little bit about how that operates. There is a nonprofit cooperative trust. So that's a business model or a business entity around this. And then there are experience layer interfaces. Currently, we're in the process of speculative design and development phase around all of this. And when we build and deploy all of these elements, we'll then package them up and make them open and available for others to fork and use on their own. Here are some more details of the project. I'm going to read from left to right. So you can see that artists are managing their archive on NAS drives in the studio. So what that means, instead of the artist taking your inventory, it sits in a network attached storage drive in your studio. That's your inventory. You own it. Um, artists then seed backups of each other's archives through a, a private IPFS network. Um, so everything's encrypted, but if your node goes down, you can restore it from everyone else in the network. And then we're also allocating space on these network attached storage drives for different um, nodes to run. So there are compute, shared compute resources that come together in this ecosystem. So those artist studios are really at the center. And artworks are prepared into archival information packages by conservators. And this is a well-tested process that currently happens within museums and collections right now. And then they're appraised. And that's what's different. And you see here at the center, the Filecoin ecosystem entering the picture. And so artist proofs will be committed to the trust with Filecoin virtual machine storage deals, which essentially backs the longevity of this data in a new way. So we have this sort of triple redundancy. You have your NAS drive, you have it uh, stored with everyone else in the 
uh, private IPFS network, and then you have a long-term storage deal running on Filecoin. So all of this comes together as a cooperative. Now, this is a business entity which is holding this value and this worth together. It is an artist-owned cooperative. It has backing from both L1 foundations, development grants, arts grants, other contributors, and then importantly, experts also banking their time to add value to this. And it funds the operation care and IP development of this whole ecosystem of audience experiences. Now, what's different is that this is a direct line from the artist studio to the audience experience with artist-owned data. And so the very first part that we're building is this decentralized catalog. I'm going to show you a quick video prototype, but it's built on WinFS, which is for encryption, UCAN for permissions. And in the future, we're looking at using IPVM for compute as well. That's some developer speak if anyone in the room is familiar with some tech that's happening in this ecosystem. And all of this comes together again as open IP, which can then be um, forked and scaled, hopefully as a public good. I think if enough people implement this kind of self-sovereign way of owning and appraising their data, it could really be a huge change for how we think about AI training, digital asset management, and decentralized compute powers that we all need to continue to be relevant in the rapidly changing ecosystem. This is a live demo. Trust.transfer.art is where the demo is housed. And our roadmap really started with this proof of concept for a decentralized catalog of artworks. This is the first audience touchpoint. We partnered with Fission, RIP Fission. They have recently dissolved, but long live Fission. Their protocols live on. And we built out this prototype which is fully decentralized and it demonstrates a very simple use case. So when you start trusting, what you're doing is you're registering your web browser as a secure node in the data trust. You pull down the data and replicate the data from the decentralized web on your machine. We know that lots of copies keep stuff safe. Thank you, Danny, for mentioning that in the intro. And you can see here some of the founding artists. We've been restoring works from our historic inventory updating them and bringing them into the system in preparation for appraisal and commitment to the trust. So if you're interested in collecting, you can make an offer if the work is available, or as a curator, you can make an exhibition request. And when you make an offer, you can see that the data trust backs this work in perpetuity, reducing the risk for collecting experimental media art. And our hypothesis is that decentralized conservation and care can really help create efficiencies together. For example, maybe an update comes out to Unreal Engine and we can parse across all of the artist nodes and we can see which artworks are at risk for loss and do bulk updates. So on the next slide, together we believe that we can ensure the works will remain accessible and can tend to their value. Decentralized storage uniquely addresses so many of the pain points in this field. And I'm a true believer that artists will lead the way in experimenting and showing society at large a new way to think about the value of their data. So I urge you all to think about the value of your data. Your data does have value. Many of us in the tech industry, our entire careers, our IP, everything exists as data scattered across cloud storage, old machines, unusable archives. We're entering a new era right now of computation where AI can generate data at dizzying rates. But there's something that we all have that AI doesn't, and that's originality and experience. And we must take back our data from the web 2.0 hegemonies and rethink our relationship to access and equity in the data that we've created in our lifetimes. So on the last slide, just to close out with a little bit of optimism, this is an animated gift from Lorna Mills. As we move into this next generation of network culture, we have the opportunity to build better open and self-sovereign systems and new forms of equity and care. I hope you found something that might apply to your industry in this talk. And just a quick plug before I pass it off. If you're in New York City next week, Transfer Data Trust is showing at an art fair during freeze week. We're showing at Future Fair and we're showing Lorna Mills. We're going to have a big, cool installation there. So if you're in New York City and you'd like to check it out, please come by. We'd love to continue the conversation about the next generation of cultural infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kalani. Our next demo is Saved by Open Archive, a secure archiving verification mobile app. Open Archive helps history's first responders safely store, verify, and share critical evidence. Natalie, founder and executive director, Open Archive is joined by Lauren Salim, their program director. Natalie's an archivist and ethnographer 
working at the nexus of human rights, design, and technology. She aims to protect and amplify community media by helping organizations better manage, encrypt, and preserve their evidentiary media. She consults with human rights focused organizations worldwide and was a 2019 fellow at Stanford's Digital Civil Society Lab. Lauren's research interests include online harms, public participation rights, and access to information. She received her master's in human rights from the University of London, where her research focused on advocacy efforts for African Nova Scotians' rights to participate in public affairs and land title issues. With that, I will pass the mic to Natalie and Lauren. Thanks so much. Kalani, that was such an inspiring chat. It made me think there's one connection between our work, which is the most evident to me, which is flipping the power paradigm. And so I think bringing artists to the forefront and having them have more control by leveraging these amazing tools and these emergent archival decentralized concepts and tools is exactly what we're doing for activists. Thank you so much for hosting TechSoup. And we are so grateful to the Filecoin Foundation for the centralized web to allow us to do this work and share it with all of you. Today, we're going to share a little bit about what we do at Open Archive, who we are, and then do a demo of our secure mobile media archiving app, SAVE, which is an acronym for Share, Archive, Verify, and Encrypt. Evidentiary archives are a powerful lever for justice and accountability. And anyone with a smartphone now has the power to record evidence. With smartphones in our pockets, we have the opportunity to watch the watchers, or what I like to call perform surveillance, the opposite of surveillance, in order to hold those in power accountable. We work to protect human rights by helping eyewitnesses preserve, verify, amplify, and make accessible for the long term their evidentiary media in, a, in the hopes of achieving accountability and justice. We do so by conducting co-research with our partner communities to better understand their risks. We then host workshops, create best practice guides, and train them on how to use SAVE, as well as doing security trainings and other types of behavioral trainings specific to their needs and context to make sure that what they're doing, when and how is as protective and secure as possible. And then lastly, we use these findings to update and enhance SAVE. So we're essentially a research and development organization that uses an iterative process over the last, I would say, let's see, we're at 14 years now to build and grow and iterate and to co-research and co-design with these amazing communities. So after a few years of doing my master's project at UC Berkeley School of Information and then turning that into a prototype, I founded Open Archive in 2015 to make our mobile archiving tool as secure, intuitive, and responsive as possible for at-risk communities. We do this by partnering with what we call decentralized archivist communities in the MENA, Latin America, Ukraine, and U.S. regions. And we are ever expanding. Slide four, please. Through our work with these DACs, we're learning and sharing real-world challenges and opportunities that they face around evidentiary archiving in order to amplify their causes and ensure our tools meet their needs. We'll soon be integrating decentralized web storage into SAVE to better serve our community's needs for robust, secure, accessible archives. Since it's still somewhat nascent, we will be working to improve its usability and privacy. We are the skeptics in the room because we are working with such highly at-risk people. We figure that if we are able to safeguard the D-Web for them, it can only benefit all of us downstream. And we have this amazing opportunity before things go south to help put the guardrails on the next web. And we're really excited about doing that in our little corner of archiving and privacy. I'm going to hand it over to our program director, Lauren, who's going to guide you through our save demo. Thanks so much, Natalie. Please. Save is a free and open source mobile app designed to help you store, share, and amplify your mobile media. Like Natalie mentioned, Save is an acronym which stands for Share, Archive, Verify, and Encrypt, which are the four key features that Save offers. We like to think of Save as a workflow tool that provides a way of securely sharing your mobile media from your phone to a private or public server and archive. It also provides a way to receive and verify media in an organized way. When you first download the Save app in Google Play or the App Store, Apple App Store, you'll see a few welcome screens that walk you through what Save does, which is shown here. After clicking through those welcome screens, you'll see another screen that lays out your server options for where you can send your media to. You have the option of a private web dev compatible server, the Internet Archive, which is a public option, and Google Drive. It's important to note that Save 
doesn't store your media, but gives you the ownership of where your media is stored. So this slide looks shows you what it looks like when you connect to a private server. And when you're storing media privately, we prefer to use Nextcloud because it is triple encrypted and allows upload chunking, which is helpful for those in low connectivity areas as it will upload your media as you gain internet connectivity and pause when you lose it until you get it back. This screen shows the connection process for Internet Archive if you're interested in uploading media to a public server. Now that you've selected where you want your media to go, you'll see you have the option to create a new folder on the server or browse existing folders. By offering the option to browse existing folders, organizations can maintain integrity in their databases by creating organized folders per project, location, date, etc. that they can invite users to upload to. If you'd like to switch to a different folder or server, you can click the hamburger menu that you'll see at the top right of your, the screen. If you click the down carrot on that server you're connected to, you can see which folders you're, you already have. You can also add a new folder by clicking add folder just at the bottom of the screen. And if you'd like to add a server, you can click add server with the plus sign in the middle there. After selecting your server and your folder, you can now add media from your camera roll or gallery by clicking on the plus sign and then selecting the media. It's not shown on this slide, but you're also able to upload other types of files like voice notes and PDFs if you press and hold that plus icon and tap files in the pop-up that would appear. After choosing which media you want to upload, you can add context setting metadata to the location notes field that you'll see here. You can tap and hold the media squares if you wanted to bulk edit those two fields. You can flag any of these files as significant content, which will root them into subfolders within the upload folder on the server, which we'll take a look at in a moment. For many of the communities we work with, this helps them protect archive managers from seeing violent or disturbing images when reviewing the collection. However, it can also be used as a favorites folder if you wanted to save important media in that subfolder. As your files are uploading, you can watch the progress from two different scenes. The gallery view that you'll see in the second panel shows the progress indicators from the main page that you can, you can also tap the little edit option at the top right to edit the upload order of the files. It's gonna take one more minute to chat about settings. As you'll see, we have three options for our settings on the settings screen. Under general settings, you can choose to send media via save when connected to Wi-Fi only. You can also turn on proof mode for additional verification. You can turn on Tor for enhanced media encryption and transit, block screenshots to prevent sensitive media from being shared and misused, or switch to dark and light mode. Under server settings, you will be able to enable chunking on Nextcloud servers or fully remove the server from the app. This doesn't remove your media from the server, but just the thumbnails that you saw on that media upload screen and your connection to the server within the app. The folder settings allow you to set Creative Commons licensing per folder or per server. When creating a new folder on the server, you'll be prompted to choose from three questions to set your Creative Commons license. Those questions are shown here. This helps archivists, filmmakers, and anyone interested in reusing your media better understand your intentions for that use. This slide shows us what our uploaded media will look like when you send it to, in this instance, a Nextcloud server. You'll see the folders with the date stamps on that left screen. And then when you click into one, like on the right side of the screen, you can see that we have a significant content folder where someone flagged their media for upload, as well as some JSON files that will contain metadata for each file. So this is what it looks like if you've opened one of those JSON files. You can see more details, including the Creative Commons license, the notes that were added, some location information, as well as the original file name and the SHA hash to help verify the media after upload. That's, oh, one more slide after this, sorry. Thank you so much. That's the end of uh, my demo for today. Thanks so much for joining. Natalie and I are really looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Natalie and Lauren. Welcome Adam Rose from Starling Lab. Adam will show how a groundbreaking cryptographic archive published by Rolling Stone helped reopen a 30-year-old cold case using the Starling framework. Capture, well, store, you. verify. Oh, Adam, I'm just going to give you a bit, a bit of bio and then 
I'll I'll call you, you call you on. Give me five seconds. Adam's the COO of Starling Lab for Data Integrity, an academic research center co-founded by Stanford and USC. The lab helps establish trust in digital records with a focus on the fields of journalism, law, and history. They leverage technologies like cryptography and decentralized systems to confront modern challenges from image manipulation to the disappearance of evidence from social media. The lab frequently collaborates with newsrooms on investigations. And last year, their projects won several journalism industry awards for innovation and received a News Emmy nomination. With that, welcome, Adam. Thank you very much, Billy. Eager to get started here, of course. Thanks to TechSoup and everyone for being here today. Before we get into the slides, I'll re reiterate a couple of those points that Billy brought up about what we do at Starling. We were co-founded by Stanford and USC, and specifically at Stanford, the Department of Electrical Engineering. And at USC, it's the USC Shoah Foundation, which is well known for its work doing genocide research, collecting testimonials from the Holocaust, as an example. And so our founding director, Jonathan uh, Doten, found a really powerful intersection to build on here in terms of the ideas of technology and what they can do for humanity and human rights. As uh, Billy mentioned, we work in the field by applying uh, the practice, our, our, our tech to the practice areas of journalism, uh, law, and history. We prototype these implementations. And so we aren't necessarily developing our own products uh, and going to market with them, but we're showing how they can be used to benefit society. And when we think about this with the USC Visual History Archive, um, we, on a storage project there as part of our history program, uh, have preserved over 56,000 testimonial videos and uh, audios from survivors of uh, genocides. And these are really important, powerful testimonials that could be subject to denialism for generations and often have been. Uh, on our legal accountability side, our team is gathering uh, war crimes evidence in Ukraine as we speak. And on the journalism side, we tend to collaborate with these news orgs. And when we go to this, we'll dive into one uh, of these now to demo what's really a front end of a first of its kind um, uh, journalism archive. So with these sorts of collaborations that we do, we're really looking at what are the highest stakes possible and how do we make this need for this sort of preserved uh, digital media relatable to people? So we've done that with Reuters, Associated Press, Black Voice News, and even freelancers. This particular story with uh, Rolling Stone is called The DJ and the War Crimes. And if we go to the next slide, we see an infamous photo uh, taken in 1992 in Bailina, Bosnia. Uh, ultimately, the story, the, the journalism project that was done is a whodunit at its real core. It's who is this person who, while we're not showing the full image in any of these slides, uh, is in the act of committing what is alleged to be a war crime. It's been 30 years without justice or accountability for this individual who is being depicted fairly callously. He's flicking a cigarette. And over the years, this particular photo has been subject to denialism. And it went viral for the time in 1992. It was in Time magazine. And the images were used to confront one of the generals who oversaw the paramilitary unit this person was a part of, who denied that they were really showing what they seemed to very clearly show. And even more recently, when Russia invaded uh, Crimea in, I think, 2014, this image started to circulate again with false claims that this showed a Ukrainian soldier committing war crimes against civilians there in Crimea. When we go to our next slide here, we see the sorts of elements that are commonly in any sort of journalism investigation. You go and collect evidence. This famous photo, along with several of the others here, were taken by an American photographer named Ron Haviv, who had always hoped that his work, his photojournalism, would lead to accountability. Not only did we republish this original photo, but also for the first time, we're able to include several others that had never been seen before and never shown on the internet or made available really to anyone else. And so that was an important part of this work to realize that this very ephemeral media on some level, the film slides that were part of his collection could now be preserved and, and you know, made available to others along with all the other evidence in, in this investigation. So on the next slide, we uh, get a teaser here of what everyone sees as they start to read this very compelling and powerful story. It's this first of its kind cryptographic archive. And what would that archive include if you think about it? And if you go here to the next slide, in that top corner, there's an accounting of over uh, nearly 2,000 documents, uh, I think PDFs, things like that, 40 images, and then 183 web archives, which are more than just a screenshot, but a far more robust way of capturing information that's on the internet and very much at risk of link rot or disappearing for any number of reasons. 
On our next slide, we talk about our Starling framework, which echoes some of the approaches that you've heard already here today. For us, we think about three important stages of, uh, the, of a piece of digital media's life cycle. There's the capture phase, which needs to include thought very carefully around a cryptographic root of trust. How do we start to bake in verifiable metadata? There's critically the matter of storing this material. Digitization is not in and of itself preservation. And obviously, as most of us are here to talk about today, that storage component is important. And these sorts of stories show us why. And then verification is also key as well. Can you use different systems, blockchains to verify maybe the date and time that something was registered or other metadata that is cryptographically secure? We'll talk a little bit about how we captured some of this material on the next slide, where you see a still from story. And this is the actual film slide that was uh, taken from Ron Haviv's camera in Bayelina, Bosnia, that it put in a paper frame. Now, in order to bring that into the uh, 21st century, we had to digitize it. So we used uh, what you see there. It's called a bellows that the slide goes in, and that's attached to a modern digital camera. That camera was tethered to a phone with a secure enclave. And so we were able to start to apply uh, a cryptographic root of trust and start to add authenticity markers to this as it was being scanned with the person who could uh, make an attestation that this was indeed his own true original film slide, that it was not the versions that had been manipulated or lied about on the internet in recent decades. If we go to the next slide, we see another type of record that is included in this archive. Uh, these are payroll uh, documents from the paramilitary group uh, that was uh, at the center of uh, this alleged atrocity. And uh, many of these were stored on servers, which we were told by, as a team, our reporters were told that, uh, that they were confidential and would not be accessible. But fortunately, they were found sitting uh, in the clear on public servers of the United Nations. And so knowing that when the story went published, those might be hidden once again, all of these were, were preserved. And we used a tool called Web Recorder that some of you may be familiar with. And then we also were careful to redact certain names that weren't subject to the investigation. When we go to our next slide here, we see a social media post. And the one person we didn't blur out here is one of the names that was on that payroll document. And throughout social media, uh, our uh, reporter, Sophia Jones, was able to track down and identify the connections that different people who were part of this paramilitary group still had in modern day. Now, if you think about social media today and how ephemeral that can be, it could be a mer mercurial CEO that causes accounts to disappear, or it could be people who set them to private and posts can also be deleted. So we knew that when the story went live, things like this could disappear and make it hard for investigators to piece back together who was connected to whom. I'll also note that you know, as uh, scary as that paramilitary group might be, the person seen here, uh, whose name is on the payroll records of that group, uh, in this photo is associating with uh, the Night Wolves, the Russian motorcycle gang, which actually was uh, supporting uh, Russia's initial invasion in Crimea. So let's bring this to the archive itself. On our next slide here, we see the user experience that people get to explore when they go into the story and dive into this archive. Uh, all of these documents uh, are spread out so that you can build your own associations between them. Look at social media posts, news clippings, payroll records, photographs, original ones scanned from 30 years ago, and also some ones taken more recently as part of this investigation. Any of these might be vulnerable, but because they are all stored and secured using Web3 technologies, it empowers us to ensure that they survive and that they are not subject to future denialism. Each one of those assets that you see there, as well as when you read throughout the rest of that story, has a little eye icon that you can click to open up. And when you do, this next slide here shows you what we call an authentication certificate. Now, increasingly, you may hear about things with, say, C2PA and content credentials. And really, this is tied to the same idea. And in fact, we use C2PA as a part of this. And in the authentication certificate, you can see how we establish different chains of trust. You can see different asset details. We'll come back to the inspect asset button there in a second. But then the next slide shows what happens when you scroll down. And this, I think, will resonate with many people who are here to think about decentralized storage solutions. You again see the Starling framework of capture, store, and verify. And so we provide additional information, additional places that the, these assets have been registered to establish their authenticity and also where they've been stored. And in this particular project, we used IPFS, Filecoin, and storage. And having content addressed assets like this ensures that in the future, people can find them 
even if they were to start to disappear as many pieces of this the content have over the years. I mentioned that inspect button, which is a neat thing as well for people to think about how we trust modern digital media. And so on our next slide, if people had clicked that button in the live experience on the web, it opens up any of these assets or most of these assets, I certainly should say, into the content credentials website where they have a verified tool. And this shows you the edit history. Now, let's be realistic. Any photo that we see is going to be edited most likely on some level. Your camera phone often starts to manipulate that photo even as you take it starts to make color correction and different sorts of adjustments. Now, something like this in a journalistic project, it would be very normal to do cropping and color correction. On the next slide, this even allows you to explore those sorts of edits. Photoshop, which is what we use to do the edits, supports these content credentials and it's, it supports the inspection of them. What you can see here in this first change, it was just a crop. And what's neat to me about this particular image is that the top one, uh, the original one, has that black border around it. And if you think back to that, that picture of the slide where the, the slide is going into the bellows, that is the piece of paper around the, the film. So it's an artifact that shows you it really is from this process before we started to crop out the unnecessary parts. And then the next slide here is another way you can inspect these. So these are after you've cropped it and then after you've color corrected it. Might be a little hard to see on this particular display. And frankly, it's a good thing that it's not changed very much. But we did need to lighten that a little bit. So there's a slider view. And if you look in the sky way out in the, in the background there, you can see different tones of gray. And that's all the change was. And you can verify that with your own eyes. But we'll jump ahead now to our last few slides and where all of this led. This shows another one of those authentication certificates and why this sort of journalistic work is so important and the protection of this is so important. This photo here is the same person we saw in the original photo of the war crime being committed. The person who is at the center of this turned out to become a DJ playing at uh, festivals the size of Coachella over the years. This particular image came from a, an event in Novi Sad, Serbia, less than two years ago. And it is uh, a life of impunity. There has been no accountability for these war crimes. If you go to the next slide, this was a, an Instagram account that he had fairly recently set up prior to that performance. And the article came out just a few days later. He set that account to private, but we have that account saved thanks to Web Recorder and thanks to these content addressed Web3 archives. And all of that evidence is available for inspection, even though it's no longer available to the public if they just go to Instagram. Our next slide here brings us back to that idea of all of these connections and the people who were on social media, how they were tied together. The person in that top left is that DJ who's allegedly at the center of these war crimes that are on film. But then down from him, the southern node of this layout here, where the person in the beret in the middle was the one who was posing with the wolves previously. And you see and in that photo, if you saw the, the full photo, he's actually carrying the casket of the general. And there's all these connections that are woven throughout the story. I, I won't spoil any more of that. But these are essentially nodes in a social network. It's how they are all connected. And they are also, I think, very poignantly now parts of nodes on a decentralized storage system. And on our final slide, we acknowledge the impact of this, which is that prosecutors did reopen that 30-year-old cold case. And hopefully we will see justice on the, the final photo here, or the wedding rings from one of the, the victims who lost uh, a husband in this incident. Journalists are recognizing the need for this sort of authentication and this sort of work. They recognize the need to archive. And so a story like this really resonated within those circles and picked up a lot of industry awards and recognition, which I think speaks to the power of these technologies and these approaches. And I hope can inspire people not only to implement these for these sorts of projects, but in other ways, which will benefit all of society and uh, advance human rights. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share the work that we did on this project. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you all of the speakers this morning, we're going to just jump straight into the Q&A. And so the, the prompt here is really straightforward. Take your questions, push them into the Q&A icon in Zoom, and we will uh, have at them. Any questions or good questions here? So I've actually got one question I'm seeing here in the chat. So it came in from the uh, Gallatin Library, and it's directed to our friends at Open Archive. This question is, does this support encryption prior to upload? Does it encrypt all the docs uploaded to a chosen archive service with AES-256? That doesn't mean much to me, but I'm going to pass it over to our friends at Open Archive. 
Hi. I was just entering my question into the chat because I'm not sure how to do it. So I just want to get that out of the way before answering. But yeah, no, that's such a great idea. Um, I had mentioned before that question that we are going to be releasing a, a save flavor, I guess is what they call it, that will be fully end-to-end -end encrypted, which will really serve some of our most at-risk groups that just are being surveilled and targeted in different ways. And so this person, I think this is something we've been thinking about. One of the biggest challenges with pre-encryption is sometimes on the back end being able to decrypt it if the files are all individually encrypted. So we're focusing on making sure that the transfer is encrypted. So using transfer layer, tra transport layer security and for et cetera, and potentially even more in transit privacy tools. So yes, thank you for the question. It's something we're thinking about. I think it's all about what the trade-offs end up being in the usability space when we implement new privacy. And that trade-off has proven to be quite large when you do have encrypted files and there isn't the easiest way to decrypt them on the other end. So yes, that's why we didn't do that in the kind of initial scoping. Great. We've got a question from Stephanie. Steph Stephanie asks, can this technology be leveraged by communities and local nonprofits for overall community engagement or coordination efforts? Anyone can jump in and take that. Yes. From Open Art. I'd add that many yes. of the tools that Starling uses uh, are increasingly with, made with that in mind. And so we're, we're very much uh, hoping to do more work with, with Open Archive in particular. There are also some tools out there that are what I would call an open source you know, OSINT CMS. So some of those include Uwazi uh, and Atlas. Different purposes for some of those. Uwazi is used on a lot of accountability investigations and people need to stand that up on their own. Atlas is a little more focused on mapping and geographic based work. So those can help when people want to contribute. But I would also add that any number of these tools that can help add a root of trust on some level are really important. For example, Proof Mode is a free and open source app that anyone can install on their phones today. There are uh, a lot of other technologies that are being tested, very inaccessible technologies sometimes, an example being the cost of some cameras that have C2PA, uh, which I mentioned before, on board. Some of those are up to $10,000. On the other hand, increasingly, some are releasing uh, firmware uh, for some of their cameras, which will retroactively back support C2PA. The ability even to turn that on and provide some of those to people as part of uh, those are obviously really useful in terms of being able to make sure that archive is preserved holistically with what we would call authenticity by design. Natalie had a great question for the audience. The question was, what brought you all here? Why, why this webinar? Why, why now? Anyone can jump in from the audience on chat. Okay, Jay Jones, a former journalist. I used to work in digitization and digital asset management, now in the blockchain Web3 space and was interested in how far the technology has been adopted in archives since first learning about this a few years back. Thank you, Jay Jones. Any other questions from the audience? Can I add something to Stephanie's yeah, question? Yeah. So jump, it's always interesting right in. to to try and work out what what the fit is between tech and, and and different applications. And I think one of the things with the sort of stuff that you're seeing here is that they are naturally designed to not be constrained by a, a single institution. Like I've just been like having a headache in the last couple of days because I do sometimes use centralized tools and they're all very, okay, you have to log in, you have to share, within the organization and that is never a good fit for, for for what we do right we we sometimes we share within our organization but sometimes we want to share with other organizations and cooperate and we don't want to have to sell them get them a license possibly through TechSoup to use the software and a lot of this is designed so that you can share in little groups and move the data around without some clear organizational kind of divisions. So I think that's one of the areas where if, if you're looking at all of these tools, it fits if you are an institution, but you also work with the community and you want to take down boundaries between your institution and the, the community. Excellent points. We're going to wrap up. Um, thank you all for joining us.